Do I get? Do I have a thumbs up from Russ? He's ready. Okay. All right. This budget workshop of the Judson Board of Trustees is hereby called to order at 6.01 p.m. I am very pleased that you have taken time to join us this evening. Um, in compliance with state government code on open meetings, tonight's agenda has been appropriately posted. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded and will become part of Judson's permanent legal record. In order that the tape adequately reflects these proceedings, please silence your mobile devices and refrain from talking while others are speaking. Once again, I extend to each of you a sincere welcome from the entire school board. Thank you for your interest in Judson ISD. We have established a quorum and I will call roll. Uh, Ms. Pichel? Renee Pichel present. Thank you. Ms. Kenoyer? Suzanne Kenoyer present. Uh, Ms. King. Shatanya King, present. And I'm Jennifer Rodriguez, um, present. And I, we have our interim superintendent, Dr. Fields, as well. How are you, ma'am? Hello. All right. Um, the, uh, we've established a quorum, so the next item on our agenda is public comment. We have one person who has signed up to speak. Um, and so I'll call up uh, Fresi Molina. You can go to the podium. Good evening, board members and Dr. Phil. My name is Fresi Molina, and the lead custodian at Candlewood Elementary School. I'm a proud member of Jackson AFT. As you begin the budget workshop, I would like to remind you of the promise that was made to elementary lead custodians last year. The promise was you would give us a higher pay raise. The pay of the starting custodians pay in elementary head custodians is very close. And the work, the work and responsibility that we have is, is very, um, it's different. We have too much responsibility. Thank you for everything you guys do. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, there are no more public comments, so we'll go on to item three, discussion items report, discuss and review information on proposed 2023-24 fiscal year budget. Yes, ma'am. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I wanted to let you know that tonight is really going to be brief. It'll be one of the quickest, if not the quickest, um, budget review meeting that you have all year because tonight we're just gonna cover the things that we're going to go through throughout the budget process. And then when we come back again, we'll start diving into some of these areas that we talk about tonight. But tonight we really wanted to give you an understanding of exactly what we cover when we go through the process and kind of break it down and make it more simplistic. So on the first page inside of your handout, you'll see where it says information and discussion our plan is to talk about the 22-23 budget update and see where we are right now. And then some enrollment trends that we wanted to cover that we've gone over the last um, few years. Some budget challenges, what we view to be budget challenges going forward. And then the 23-24 budget assumptions because there's a lot of swell out there about $33 billion that's burning a hole in the governor's pocket. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, revenue projections and compensation plan discussions and um, the budget process timeline and then we'll just open it up to any questions that you guys may have of us. So the first thing that we wanted to go over is what we refer to as the general fund. And the general fund is usually what we refer to as a local budget. And um, <clears throat> what you'll see in the first column under budget is exactly what we budgeted for the year. Under actual year to date, you'll see what um, on the front first part, it speaks to revenue, what we've collected. And we'll go over these numbers to the left in just a second. And then under the numbers underneath, it says expenditures. So we'll talk about what those call for in terms of uh, expenditures throughout the year. And then over here where it says remaining, that's what we've yet remaining to um, 
uh, collect. And then the last one where it says 41, 55, and 76 percent, that's what we've already collected in those respective areas. So under the first one where it says 57, that's usually just local revenue that we have on hand. And then 58 is state funding, and then 59 is mostly federal funds. Now, there's other subsets that go in those particular areas, but in overall generality, that's what they stand for. Then under expenditures, where it says 61XX, that's payroll, and then 62 is professional contract services across the board, and then 63 would be supplies and material, 64 would be light travel, um, 65 would be debt services, and then 66 would be capital outlay. And, um, and then the percentages show on the end, but these are our budgeted ones. Now, on the next page, it speaks to, yes, oh, ma'am. Can I ask a quick Stop me clarifying anytime, question? Please. No, no, that's fine. Um, on travel, I'm assuming that's not meaning like going to conferences and stuff. Well, not that's a small part of it, but what makes up the biggest chunk of that? Is that like providing buses for our student transportation or? On travel. 64. Got it. Yeah. On 64, it would be kind of employee travel, student travel, okay. non-employee stipends, non-employee travel, insurance, bonding, election costs, depreciation. There's a whole it's a lot list of things, of things in there. under okay. each one. <laughs> but an overall of yep. what it would be for would be that. Okay, it, but it I'm includes like our yes. transportation services. Yes. Because I was yes. like, we're not spending like yes, $5 million <laughs> on travel. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Scott said that's a nice conference. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one is going to be child nutrition on the next page. And I would tell you, you're going to see some of the same subsets in the child nutrition. Child nutrition budget is not unlike um, another district within a district because they have their own fund balance, they have their own funds, and most of those funds are generated under 59 where we do reimbursements because we collect from the students and whatever we charge for the students to have to, to eat. And then you can see what we use in each one of those categories pretty much, again, the same way on the budget that we just went over. The, so the, numbers, mean, the numbers mean the same in child mm -hmm. nutrition as they do in general funds? Yes, okay. yes ma'am. Yeah, the, and then I think they refer to them as object codes. So the numbers are the object codes. And then the last one is our debt services budget. And um, this is um, revenue and then expenditures under state and um, budgeted amounts, actual year to dates, and then debt services at the bottom. And a better expl explanation under this would be interest in sinking or bond payments that we pay under the debt services. So now we start getting into <clears throat> the first draft, which is our fund balance trends. If you see going all the way back to 1516, we were about 58 million. And then um, we start going up every year. And then you see some pretty dramatic increases around the 19, 20, 20, 21, and 21, 22 school years. And the reason why is because um, COVID. You know, we were able to do a lot of things without incurring the cost that it takes to run the district on a daily basis. We're out of that now. Um, <clears throat> And then going into, um, if you wanted to know where we are, where we were at currently on our fund balance, we know that we went into the year with like a $25 million deficit budget. So you would just subtract $25 million from the 127, which would put us at about 102. So we're at about 102 now on our, our fund balance. But I can tell you that typically they recommend three months. Um, that would put us at about 65, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, that would put us at about 65, and we're still at 102. So there is a need to kind of, you know, we're up there pretty high. We need to, we could afford to spend down a little bit. Now, on enrollment in ADA trends, on the next page, at the top it shows what our enrollment is, and then on the bottom blue line it shows what our ADA 
is what we get provided funding for. So although our enrollment may be a little bit high, when you look at our current year of, um, I think this was based on this year's snapshot or last year's snapshot? This is a projection. So the, uh, this is a projection of projection. what's coming up. Yeah, the, this year is the 22-016 and what we're projecting for next year is 22-231. And I'll tell you why that's such a conservative projection in a little while. But a lot of the enrollment is based on the pre-K that we had coming in that we don't receive funding for. So um, we really want to calculate based on what we know we're going to be reimbursed for. So going into our next year, we're calculating at 2231. And we have houses that are being built on the north end. We have um, apartment complex going up everywhere. But we're still projecting maybe a modest 215 increase in enrollment because with the new registration model that we have where you have to get in during certain times and then decreasing our um, pre-K students that don't qualify, we should see a decrease in enrollment, but we don't anticipate a decrease in our ADA allotment. So we're being conservative on that as we move forward. Now the next thing that we wanted to talk about are some budget challenges. <clears throat> we are operating in a deficit budget. As we said, we started off the year with 25 million um, in the deficit. Um, we're providing appropriate comp compensation. We really have to be competitive in some cer in certain areas. There are some teaching professions out there now that every district in the state across the nation is struggling to, you know, get. And when they come to San Antonio, if we're not competitive, and what you're going to find is we're very competitive in terms of our salary. But if we're not competitive in bringing those people in, then it's going to be difficult to find special ed and bilingual. Now, we do pretty good in recruitment. I mean, we, we um, Ms. Nava has a secret place that she goes every year and brings back <laughs> a bunch of teachers that we need in specific areas. So we're looking forward to that. But um, we want to make sure that um, we keep ourselves competitive. And then the spring incentive and auxiliary uh, staff, our auxiliary, everyone gets the $1,000 incentive in December, but in our auxiliary staff, we've opted to give that in the summer for them as well. So they receive 2000 So when we start showing some of these budgets later on, I'd ask you to keep in mind that with our teaching staff, they receive the $1,000, and then with our auxiliary staff, they receive pretty much an increase of $2,000. And then our enrollment and capping schools, we think that, um, again, with those enrollment windows, with our registration that Ms. Gosh talked about before, we may see a decrease in students coming from everywhere all year long. So that may adjust, you know, the amount of students that come in. But again, with the apartment complexes and built, you know, houses that we have, we've, we've forecasted a little bit more. State challenges, school funding, and the biggest part of the state challenge with school funding is that they're in legislature right now. How are you, sir? They're in the legislature right now, and they usually make a decision around, I mean, you guys have been doing this for years, around June. And right now, they have some pretty heavy stuff in the legislature that they're talking about. But one of them definitely is an increase to the basic allotment or an increase to teacher salaries. So if we were propo to propose something, we'd really have to be conservative about that because we don't know what the mandate's going to be later on. So I would recommend that we go very low. And we, we had a huge increase last year. Or we reserve and wait and see what, what's going to happen. My apologies, sir. Oh, I'm not talking loud enough? I'll also um, name for the record that Mr. Macias has now arrived. So Thank you so five much. board members present. So um, going forward, we're going to make some proposals, but I, I would say that we probably 
be very conservative on that because we don't know what's going to come and whatever does come in terms of increases that will be above and beyond what we propose as well. Um, we're not to that part yet. This is just an overview of what we're going to be doing going forward, but I just wanted to put that out there. You're still talking about school funding? School funding. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then the other deal is school safety. We just did a survey that Governor Abbott asked us to fill out about how much would it be to put wrought iron fencing around all of the schools in the district. That's expensive. And uh, we sent in how much it's going to be. I can tell you that the grant that they're telling, the, telling us that we can apply for We'll probably do one or two schools, but they're definitely not going to do all 30-something campuses throughout the district. But they do oftentimes come back and say, we want all 30-something campuses done. In addition, they asked us to figure out how much it was for us to put the resistant film on the glasses up front. And um, that may become a mandate that we have to get done as well. Yes, ma'am. What is the cost of that wrought iron fencing that's ridiculous for all 30 schools? You know, I, I, I don't want to hazard a guess. I can tell you that last time I spoke with Mr. Hernandez, because he put that survey together for us and submitted it, um, it was a lot, a whole lot. It was 13, 15 million. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So um, we would have to do that in increments, ask for grants and things like that to get done. Or concentrate on just certain areas, the approachable areas. You know, some areas are covered in the back, but, you know, I don't want to get too far into it and then let everyone in the district know what we plan to, to do or how we're going to do it. Another one could be uh, teacher shortage. We have been talking in senior staff, and we have had professors come in and tell us that they're actually canceling their teacher certification programs at some universities because there's a lack of interest. So, um, and we're going to get to our district of intervention because Mr. Macias made a statement in the last board meeting that we wanted to address in this overview as well. But because there's such a huge teacher shortage, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, there's been a, a social emotional swing since we came back from COVID that um, the students, the teachers, the parents, everybody's struggling with in terms of trying to get back to what's the norm because it's a new norm and we're trying to figure that out. I can tell you that salary is an issue as well um, because <clears throat> what we used to do when we used to teach, you know, we were just, you know, we were used to it. We had been bred, it's what we did all the time. Teachers are staying a lot later, doing a lot more and being asked a lot more of now. And um, I'm not quite sure that the compensation shows that. I'm talking about nationwide, not in Judson ISD. So. Um, we used to just be able to be flexible. Where was it? We were flexible. That's what you had to know that that was what the buzzword was. Exactly. Flexibility. Exactly. But it's exactly. much different now. <clears throat> and um, the mindset is different now. Yes, it is. You know, it's not about I'm salary employee, so you can. Keep me here as long as you, right. you know. Yeah. So um, now, in terms of the teacher shortage, I would tell you that all of the districts are going after the same group of people, mm -hmm. and um, it really depends on how competitive we're going to be. So, um, well, yes, sir. What I'll say to that, that um, will be part of the conversation as we continue through this, is that um, you know I've been told salary matters. Compensation matters, and it does. And I was very proud to be a part of uh, this board where we led the largest compensation increase in, in decades. It, it didn't retain, like the whole goal was to retain talent, but because of the atmosphere that we're in now, it's harder to do that. So, just for the sake of this conversation, I will be asking the administration to put together a employee retention committee, a committee that will be focused on determining what other peripheral benefits is there to staying with us if we can't compensate you? It's the same question I asked last year. I just don't know how far down we went to determine what those type of added values would be. And in a time where we don't have unlimited funding, we certainly want to look at that. So you, you make a good point, Mr. Macias. I, I would ask you, though, the, to keep in mind that there's some things that we've already done 
that um, limit our ability. One of the big things that you see, I mean, if we're all watching TV right now, we see that a lot of districts are debating the four-day school week. And at first glance, I looked at that and said, yeah. But when you think about it, that's, that's huge. I can tell you that one of the biggest things that we're seeing is quality of life and time people can spend with their families. And when you go to a four-day work week and you're able to be off three days a week, it adds to that, um, especially if your kids are in that same district and you're having time to spend with them. So that might be something that we even look at. But well, it would have to be for next year because we've already approved the calendar. Well, and I, I certainly am in where you were, where I don't think we could ever do that as well. So I'm not, I'm yeah, not reached I, that next I, level I'm, yet. I'm putting it but, out there because I'm thinking but, some, some, some districts really close to us are going to start doing that. Well, so. more power to them. I want to watch that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, more power to them. But I'm thinking more since, since obviously I'm not in the classroom and today's teacher, it's, it's again, circumstances are different. What are some of those things that... Uh, beyond that option are possible um, certain professional development tracks, for example, um, time off and literally time off where they have a sub come in and, and give them a day to do whatever they need to do, almost giving them less time, in, I mean, not less time, more time to prepare. Understood. So I'm, again, I don't know. These are just out yes, when they may not be viable, but certainly the idea is to get that employee retention discussion going with everything but compensation. And, and I know that you'll get input across from custodial staff to teachers in the classroom. And, and that's where we as a board can come in and then figure out what can we support, and obviously with your leadership too, yes, determine sir. what's best. Because right now there is no differentiation. Everyone is competing for the same person. So what do we need to do? Make it better to work here. I would agree. And so it's not an easy task, but certainly one that we need to Look we'll put something together, whether it's well, a Well, just, again, put it out there because it's part of this discussion, and I would like to have it impact this budget cycle. Yes, sir. Um, at least reasonably, of course. Yes, sir. But anyway, that's it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Now, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is um, the legislative report <coughs> and some of the things that we see going on in the legislature. Now, I'm not saying that they'll vote yes on any of these things. This is just rumor mill and some of the bills that are out there. I'm not confident that the Senate is going to pass them, although they may, but I'm not confident that the House would pass. The biggest one that you hear about all the time is school vouchers. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm pretty confident that that's gonna fly through the Senate, but I'm not confident that it's gonna have the support on the House floor. But what they're saying is they want to increase school vouchers to include you know, private school to include homeschool, <laughs> to include wherever you would like to take your student outside of public education. So that means that you could take the funding that goes along with that with you to whatever you do, which really puts um, a burden on the public schools because we need to take all students that come. And, and uh, what I've heard is that number is more than they give us to educate the child in, our, in the district. So they're gonna give them a larger amount to educate that one child than we get to educate the one child. So I find that fascinating. Understood, <clears throat> yes ma'am. Now the other thing that you see on here is um, school of choice. The school of choice is really reserved for places like a Dallas, a Houston, a San Antonio, where there's a bunch of options. But if you're in rural town, Texas, and the nearest ISD is 40 miles away, it really, you know what I'm saying, school of choice isn't really a factor. Right. So um, when we start seeing those things come through, I think we're really thinking about big city, but there are so many rural districts out there that it's gonna be difficult for something like that to gain traction. Um, teacher pay raises, we talked about that before, that may come in June, so we need to be prepared for that. And then we talked about um, keeping our schools safe and secure. The other thing that we're hearing is checks for retired teachers. But again, unless they're asking us to put in more into <laughs> TR. <laughs> Give me a raise. No. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Unless they're asking us to put more into TRS, then that's going to be something that they do at the TEA level. Then forget about that. So the next one are budget assumptions for 23-24. 
We're saying that we're projecting our average daily attendance to be 22,231. And let me catch up over here. And we explained the reason why we're going with 22,231, and we know that this year we're um, receiving ADA for 2216 is because we're trying to be conservative on that number. We don't want going into taking away pre-K-3 and going into putting up a window for registration. We don't want to get too far out there with our projections and find ourselves um, that we've overstated it. The estimate, estimated taxable value, and this fluctuates, it'll change, but right now it's about 12 billion. We um, usually collect estimated tax collections of 98%. Our maintenance and operations, which is our payroll, is usually, um, we're projecting at 0.842, which one now? Oh, and then our tax rate is about 0.391 for a total tax rate of 0.237, I'm 1.233. Our campus allotment staffing based on the district of formula, we're, we're getting ready to go through this. We're going to talk about it later on, but I don't know if it's the next slide. Is it? No. But we're going to talk about our campus uh, allotment and our staffing. That's going to be one of the things that we're doing coming up next in March, correct? And uh, we'll be sitting down talking to all the campus principals about how we want to staff them, especially in the K through 5 areas. So we have some suggestions there as well. But um, compensation plan. We'll bring that to you later on. There are some areas that we want to reclassify positions. We want to look at our stipends that we're giving right now because um, we think that we can tighten that up and not have it be so subjective um, based on whoever's making the call. Um, conversations on staff raises, we talked about that earlier. We would say that we go low. Um, the most we would recommend is a 1% increase at this point. And then, but I would almost say we should wait until June to figure out, they could come back and say, we need to do something like four or five. So we, we don't want to over obligate ourselves. But I do anticipate the state legislature coming back saying that there's going to be an increase for um, educators across the uh, state. Um, We've compared our JISD salary wages with other area districts. And then we also want to talk about our elementary classroom size ratios, district of innovation teachers, and um, board feedback. So the first one is starting pay rates. If you click over, or not even click over. <laughs> So used to being on the PowerPoint. But the first one says starting pay. So the first line says Judson ISD, and then you see Southside. Southside has really jumped out there. Um, and then we've kind of rank structured the rest of them in decrease. So you can see that Judson's very you know, competitive in terms of new teacher or starting teacher salaries across our area in San Antonio. And um, for custodians and CNN workers and bus drivers, I'd ask that you can see where we find ourselves competitive in those areas. Um, you can see where bus drivers kind of kicked up there because, again, this is one of those areas where it's hard to find um, personnel. But keep in mind that we have the $1,000 incentive in December and another $1,000 incentive in June that we pay out as well. So those need to be considered. Next is current compensation benefits. These are things that we do in the district already. We provide $30,000 life insurances per employee. Um, we also provide $355 a month towards employee health insurance. Um, we also provide employer-provided mental health counseling services, up to five sessions for each employee. We have the ESSER initiative that we do in December with $1,000. And then again, the um, auxiliary and clerical incentive of an extra $1,000. Now, teacher to student ratio. 
We'll probably come back and make a recommendation to the board going forward that based on our, our enrollment, we are going to start staffing. We're not going to do it on that snapshot. And we told, we explained how we feel like that's going to give her, us a better assessment of what we have going into the beginning of the next year. We've anticipated 18 additional teachers based on this program that we'd like to. For um, K through five, we would look at 21 to one. We would staff at 21 to one which would be an increase of 18 FTEs. That 18 FTEs would come out to about 1.3 million in cost. But we think that that will go a long way in ensuring that we try not to go over the 22 to one with the teachers in the classroom. But again, that'll be a proposal that we bring going forward. Um, we can get more specific. I know that if you were, um, We'll get more specific as we go forward on those, but we're anticipating now an estimate of about 18 FTEs, and that's what the price would come to. The next one would be District of uh, um, Innovation Incentive Option. We spoke, um, Mr. Macias made a point about um, the amount of pay that the DOI teachers receive versus um, our, permit, our certified teachers. I would tell you that this district of innovation is getting put in most districts across the state. This isn't exclusive to Jetson. And the reason why is because you can take, and we have found degreed individuals, we found subject matter experts in math, science, English, and social studies who just don't have the certification to teach in those areas. And when you have a secure degreed subject matter expert, teaching in that class every day, where if we didn't have that person, it would be a sub if we could get one, um, it makes a difference. And it's better for our students. So we feel like this was an excellent move on our part. And I can tell you that we have 102 of those teachers across the district, and we've put this graph next to it to show you how many per campus. Now, one of the things that we'll probably uh, recommend going forward is that maybe we pay a thousand dollars to a veteran teacher as a mentor to some of those teachers to work on their certification and um, get them to work with each of the district of innovation teachers as we go forward. Yes, ma'am. Is it a possibility that grants can be written? in order to be able, grants can be written in order to be able to sustain those teachers? Yes, we're always looking at grants and now that we have our new grant writer, one of the things that she's doing is she's even holding um, specific sessions with teachers and administrators for any grants that are out there. There, whether or not there's a specific grant for this, there's specific requirements with all the grants, but that's what we would do. and. and Part of the Office yeah. of Innovation is to continuously seek out grants right. to help cover any costs in right. education. Thank you. And I will say that this is a very healthy mentor stipend. Like most of the mentor stipends I've seen are about half that. Um, and so that is an incentive to work more deeply. And um, I think I would just want to see like that the expectations for the mentors are very clear. I'm sure that's part of it. We, but, we had that conversation um, <laughs> as well. What's the return on investment? What yeah. does that look like? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And we were thinking Maybe is 500 it? and then you get a $500 bonus if the person successfully completes their, I love that. their certification I love that. Yes, or something. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Fields, um, these 102 teachers that we have currently, are they all in a certification program? I don't think so, ma'am. Hold on. Okay. I'm going to. So they, they, they are all okay. of them. Good. They, they have good. to be in a certification program to be hired. Oh, that, that was okay. a requirement that so we that put on. So that was established, yes, I see. That's great. That's helpful. That I is. also agree that um, it's hard for any new teacher mm -hmm. um, not to have a, a strong mentor to help them through. That's true. Um, and so um, these 
babies that are coming to us, and, and I use that baby teachers not as not referring to age, but experience. Um, it's even harder for them because they haven't had a student teaching experience. They haven't had a lot of the things, you know, that the, the, the teacher certification, when you go the traditional route, provides. So having a good veteran teacher mentoring them, I think is really going to help with retention. Um, and it's going to help with that work-life balance that those teachers are going through because we know they're teaching all day, they're trying to prep, they're trying to plan, they're trying to grade, and then they're trying to complete that certification at the same time. Exactly. So this is a great plan. I'm really on board. And I love the half and half. I do too. And and thanks for Joseph. Thanks Joseph on that. I um I'd also say that what I learned in trying to get ready for the contracts mm -hmm. is that with the District of Innovation you have to approve the contract going forward. It's not an automatic rollover approval. So we'll have to go through each 102 to determine whether or not we move forward. So, yes, sir. I appreciate the dialogue. And certainly there's a lot more conversation with this. Naturally, my um, reasoning for bringing up the differential in salary for non-certified versus certified was to start that conversation so that we can look at it strategically. Obviously, you know, we've always identified teachers who have a certain career experience. There's no way we're gonna get them certified. I wouldn't, wouldn't even ask us to do that. My main concern is when you have a non-certified in a general ed area, and there are 59 teachers here that are in elementary that would fall potentially in, in my mind, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, in an area that doesn't have a specific trade or, you know, they're elementary, it's first pre-K through sixth grade. But those teachers, if, if they're not in a certification program or if they're not going to be future teachers, they're drawing the same salary as someone who is certified. And if the mentor program is designed to help identify that, that's fantastic. Um, we haven't had that in place before, right? This is being recommended? As we the know. mentor program is being recommended. Okay. I can tell you, though, that based on what Mr. Gidry just said, that all of them are in a certification program so, because we made that a criteria before we All 102? All one. All one. So tell me why I'm under the impression that, that that's not the case, that we have hired. Because I know that I look at the list of hires, and, and they're coming from outside the field. So I'm under the impression they're not. But... If they are... In that they're not in yeah. a program? Yeah, that they're not in a program. So I will just say this. If they're in certification programs, it makes all the sense in the world. They're going to be teachers. Let's get them in here. We're trying to recruit. But if they are truly just being brought in because we need someone in the classroom, that's where I have my concern. So obviously, if that's not true, then I'll... Then, Do you remember? Then obviously, we're, we're in a better spot. We created, we worked with HR to create a certain criteria to select these teachers. That was one of the criteria that we established. We didn't have to, but it was something that we wanted to do. Now, whether or not those teachers are on track to completing their or program by the end of the this year is a different is, is a different matter, which and that I, we could look into. Which I think traditionally teachers are given a year, am I right, to get certified. Yeah. So naturally that's, again, if they're not on that year track, you're right, they can go off and do all kinds of things. The reason why this is important, just for example, let's just look only at the 59 teachers in elementary. Yes. If we were to deduct 10,000 from their salary, they're not making 57, they're making 10,000 less, they're making 47 because they're not certified. That's $590,000 we're saving in teachers that wouldn't be potentially in a certification program. Now, I realize it's tough. They probably can go somewhere else now and that's a, that's a challenge, and I, I can un understand that. But that's why at least I want to have the conversation, because it, I am hearing from teachers and the morale of, of them having to mentor and support teachers without additional compensation <coughs> is problematic. And, and we're trying to pick morale up in this district, not overload teachers with more responsibility, because now they're having to bring someone up to speed. So again, I commend the idea of a stipend for that type of scenario, but I would just again go back because I would like that data for this conversation. What is the track record for these elementary? I'm not gonna even worry about middle school and high school. I'm assuming we're hiring subject matter experts in, in those areas where there's gonna be more of a need. But I, I would just hope that 
that the statement is accurate and that we do have teachers on that track. What will we do with the ones that are not, that we have flexibility? And, and, and again, I, I was just saying before, when it comes to the contracts, we were yeah. just going through that. When we get ready to send those out, typically for certified teachers, the contracts just come up and we have to identify whether or not we're going to not give you a contract going forward. But with the District of Innovation teachers, we don't give a contract and you have to identify whether you're going to move forward with those teachers before the contract goes out. So everyone will be evaluated to determine whether or not it's working or not, um, or whether or not they've made progress towards their certification. Um, I, I, I think, did we give them two years or? No, so the, the District of Innovation plan expires this mm -hmm. uh, June. So unless the board actually approves that segment of the innovation plan, Going this forward. won't even be a discussion. So uh, DOI plan, teachers get one year. Principals, I know that Ms. Nava specifically asked for the list of teachers um, who are DOI, whom the principals would like to move forward. So there is a, a greater scrutiny on that level of personnel that we hired because we want to ensure that moving forward, should the board approve that portion of our DOI plan, that we have the right people to continue. Um, I do know that they were asked to complete, um, and, but we can definitely provide that information on the upcoming Friday notes, what the completion rate is for that program. Um, but I will say that that's why we're bringing the DOI plan in March, because if you don't approve that, we can't even offer the contract. Well, I would also say, Mr. Macias, like, I would also say, Mr. Mr. Macias, that um, a couple of things. One, I would not support ha reducing the salary for teachers who are in this situation because they are doing the work of a teacher, and that is very strenuous. On top of that, if they're enrolled in a certification program, they are probably paying five to seven thousand dollars a year. <laughs> in fees for that program. So that is essentially like a salary cut, you know? I agree. Um, and uh, so I think, and, and with the safeguards in place that we're paying a mentor teacher for that additional support, um, which a mentor teacher is often required by the certification program that they're assigned a mentor, but that work is often not compensated. It's up to the district to whether they pay that. Um, and so this is a very, very generous compensation for that. But I hear what you're saying for sure, that it does create this kind of dynamic of like, well, why did I work so hard to get my teacher certification or go to college for this? But we're in a different world right now, and I don't think we should be penalizing teachers that have proven that they're doing a good job and if the principal is saying that they want them back because maybe they haven't been able to pass a test or something like that. Well, um, uh, again, if they're in a certification yeah. program, the point is mute. I mm -hmm. agree. If they're in an active program with the intent to be a teacher, that's fine. I'd even be flexible enough to say two years if necessary. But again, I'm not under that impression that's across the board. And obviously when you show the data, then, then I'll know that is the case with every one of them. But the other thought to my mind is if we're going to really have to focus on recruiting and, and really bringing in new teachers because we can't find them, we may have to bump compensation for just new teachers. And obviously we've had deep conversations about our uh, recruitment efforts in terms of going out into Texas to find teachers and programs. I think obviously a more robust effort there could be helpful as well. So there's solutions to some of these problems. I just don't want to just say, I don't want to deal with it. We're just going to give everyone the same salary when there are strategies that we can employ. And that's all that this conversation is starting. It, not to say that again, I don't understand as Ms. Rodriguez said, the dilemma is real. I get it. We need, we need quality people in the classroom. So I, again, this is a, but again, we should ask those hard questions. We should try to find some solution that will change the dynamic and improve morale and, and, and improve quality in the classroom. Well, we definitely don't want to decrease morale. And I want to be clear, <laughs> I want to be clear um, about the qualifications. These are degreed individuals, some of them subject matter experts in their area, mm -hmm. in the classrooms. Um, I, I can also say that um, we, we, 
I can, I can have Dr. Saunders speak to it. Some of these teachers are outstanding and may not be moving towards certification, but they are killing it in the classroom because it's a passion for them and they're doing what they love. So I just want to make sure that, you know, we don't, you know, take the, and I would also say that we said, I don't know if you were here, but there's a teacher shortage. Literally. It's everywhere. And there's a substitute shortage. And um, everybody's, I mean, and some programs are even canceling their certification programs. And, and all of and, us and are. And I've heard that. And so, know. again, 5,000 more for someone coming out of college. You want to work here? We're going to give you 5,000 plus. I'm not going to say that's going to solve the problem, but I'm sure it's going to be a nice incentive for someone coming out of college. We need a strategy to rebut the circumstance and not accept that this is the reality. What can we do to change that reality? And that's all I'm saying. What is our strategy? And then we look at all of it. Understood. And, and so I understand where we are. I know where, where we are. But I just feel like there are some practical solutions that might be applicable. And again, I'm open and receptive to understanding if we have the kind of quality and we're seeing the results in our star testing, and, and then by all means, let's go forward. Build that into the criteria, because whatever that subject matter expert is and they're doing well, mm -hmm. they clearly have something that makes them stand out. And I don't mean to paint everybody with the same brush. Sure. I'm not trying to say everything is great. Yeah, yeah, I'm and, and I'm trying that. to say the opposite. I'm not saying that they're it's all bad. Right, right. Thank you. you know, but okay. we're, we're, we're talking the same. Yes, but sir. if we're not having these conversations now, we're not going to get to that next step of finding a solution that could work and a strategy that we can build. Understood. This is our time. Ms. Kenora, did you have a statement? I just wanted to, to reiterate that I would not support reducing the pay of any of our District of Innovation teachers. Um, I understand the perspective of the classroom teacher who did go through the program, but if we don't have people in those classrooms, and I'm talking specifically about elementary, um, I would invite them to think ab about how much extra they're going to have to do to support the substitute that's in the classroom. Or when you can't find a substitute, those extra five kids you're getting for the day, the week, month, whatever, when they can't find somebody to come in there and they have to split the, the class. That was a hard, hard time when that happened yes. um, and usually for me it was because there was an emergency and somebody had to leave during the day um, so um, I, I just can't um, agree to anything that would keep someone from coming here and having them go somewhere else and that would definitely do it if I'm looking and I'm a, I'm a person who wants to start teaching and go through a certification program I'm gonna look where I get the highest money yes and, and another thing you said mr. Messi is about um, paying the person coming in on the entry level more, um, I would just remind you of the open statement that we had at the beginning. Well, that I missed. Okay. Uh, oftentimes when we do that, unless you do a rank structure increase across the board, you find that it tightens with people who have been here for longer periods. That is true, but again, if we're in a tough spot, and teachers who are experienced, guess what? They now get burdened with the extra load, and so it's it's a difficult deal. You're absolutely um, right. And so I certainly just want to make sure we're we're thinking about it, and we're not just accepting this reality. We're trying to find a way to remedy it. I would also add too that some districts are using retired teachers and putting them in part-time positions which again, they're only working half the day, but they're able to come back and address this. So if that's what that means, we, at least we have someone certified that is experienced in the classroom for part time. It's not ideal by no means, but it certainly would still put the type of certified teacher and quality that we need in the classroom. So again, another possibility for us to evaluate. Yes, sir. I appreciate that input. Um, we will definitely look into that. I think the last thing that we wanted to go over was um, the budget timeline. We're having our meeting today. There'll be, um, we'll start meeting with our campuses and departments um, on March, in March. And then April 18th is when we come back again. May 10th, we'll have another budget workshop. And then May 18th will be our regular board meeting. And we put our regular board meetings on here just in case you guys have uh, other questions or you want to bring stuff up. We have another opportunity to address it. Uh, June 8th would be a budget workshop. June 15th, regular board meeting. 
we would look at adopting the budget and have a budget hearing on the 22nd and set the tax rate and adopt it in August. I thought this was going to be a lot shorter. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have, ma'am. Thank you Great. so much. Um, are there any questions or follow-ups? All right. Oh. Yes, ma'am. I, I do think that we have something. Yes, we, we do pay our teachers, um, our mentor teachers a stipend. We have a mentor teacher selected per campus and they receive a stipend that's distributed in December and in May. Okay. Yeah. So we do have a mentor program. Okay, nice. But that's one per campus and this would take yes. us to one yeah. per right. Yeah. And we would still continue that program, right? That is the, that is the still one separate campus. and they focus on new teachers teachers. What we're saying here is for a DOI person who's oh. you know mm -hmm. technically and certified, it would be specifically dedicated for the DOI personnel. All right, any other follow-up questions? All right, there being no other business, we will adjourn. The time is now 6.52. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you.